Welcome to the annual Engineering Focus event to kick off National Engineers Week in Chicago. I'm Rebecca Wingate, and I am the president of the Chicago Engineers Foundation. While we cannot gather in person at our organization's home in the city, the Union League Club of Chicago, we are excited to celebrate Engineers Week virtually and welcome all of you to join us. We have a great program today with Barbara Guthrie of UL and Al Ramel of Get City Chicago as we explore empowering the next generation of women in engineering. Today's event would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors. A big thank you to our scholarship sponsor, UL, our leadership sponsor, Weaver Consultants Group, our engineering sponsors, Commissioner Mariana Firopoulos of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, Mr. John Burcham and Salas O'Brien. Thank you so much for your generosity. Proceeds from this engineering focus event benefit the student programs of the Chicago Engineers Foundation. The mission of the foundation is to encourage and empower the next generation of engineers. Our student-centered organization proudly supports students across the city with virtual K-12 engineering activities, up to 100 scholarship awards presented annually, and career resources to help Chicago students achieve their engineering career goals. More information about CEF and how to get involved is available at our website, chicagoengineersfoundation.org. Today, we kick off National Engineers Week in Chicago. Founded in 1951, Engineers Week is dedicated to ensuring a diverse and well-educated future engineering workforce. This year's theme, Imagining Tomorrow, is all about future engineers. Engineers are changing the world all the time. They create practical solutions to invent, design, and create things that matter. Now and tomorrow, engineers will be working to combat climate change, ensure cybersecurity, continue to update our infrastructure, and make the world better for everyone. Today is an opportunity to not only inspire each other, but to imagine and plan for the future of engineering. So let's get started. Today's event focuses on empowering the next generation of women in engineering. We need to ensure a diverse workforce one in which women and men are equally inspired and motivated to pursue opportunities in this vital sector. According to recent research by the Society of Women Engineers, the facts about women in engineering are improving, but there is much more to be done to make sure girls and young women see engineering as a field for them. In 2007, only 4% of young women headed, heading to college considered an engineering or STEM major. In 2017, that number improved slightly to 10%. Once in college, over 32% of women switch out of STEM degree programs. Furthermore, of the women who do attain engineering degrees, only 30% are still working in engineering 20 years later. And 30% of the women who have left the engineering profession cite organizational climate as the reason. Plus, as of 2019, just 13% of women, 13% of engineers are women. So what can we do about these statistics? How can we as individuals, as engineering professionals, and as guests here today, ensure women have a larger place and more voices within university programs and the engineering sector? How can we make engineering approachable and seen as an attainable career for girls and young women? I'm pleased to welcome our first speaker on this subject. Al Ramel is the Chicago Director of Gender Equality and Tech, Get Cities an initiative designed to accelerate the representation and leadership of women in tech to meet the demands of the industry's future. Prior to her role at Get Cities, Elle was the Director of Development at Farpoint, where she helped manage the Michael Reese Hospital site redevelopment. Before this position, she led strategic partnerships at City Tech Collaborative, the Smart City Lab of Chicago, and was also an Economic Policy Associate in Mayor Rahm Emanuel's office. She has worked on financial issues and economic development, including infrastructure, corporate recruitment, job growth, sustainability, food business, innovation spaces, and land use. She completed her bachelor's at Yale University in Urban Studies and a master's degree at Cambridge University in Land Economics and Town Planning. Welcome, Elle. And before you begin your presentation, I'd like to ask, and I know this is a tough question to start off with, if you could be any superhero, which would you be and why? Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and I'd have to say, and I know I'm speaking to the room, but um, I really would love to be Iron Man because uh, he's probably the coolest engineer out there and 
makes MIT look amazing. Um, plus you can invent anything you want to do. I'm delighted to be here um, as an urban planner. I always feel like an, I'm an aspirational or, um, engineer. So thank you so much for having me. And I'd love to present to you a new initiative in Chicago called Get Cities Gender Equality in Tech. Uh, next slide. Um, so my organization, Gender Equality in Tech is focused on a singular issue, the lack of gender parity um, in the technical workforce, um, academia and innovation spaces uh, nationally. This was a, a, an initiative inspired um, by Melinda Gates's commitment to women empowerment globally. And in the United States, this is manifested in gender equality in tech. What you see in this um, industry is a lot of sobering statistics and I'll take them through some of them here. Currently at the moment, women hold 26% of tech jobs in the United States. And if you think about the intersectionality of that, black women are just 3% of the tech workforce to just take one um, other lens. And so there was an, an, the idea of this initiative being in three cities, could we cultivate an ecosystem to marshal forward more resources, not only in technology, but in STEM to encourage that number to rise. We can and we must do better. So Get Cities chose Chicago in 2020 for their first city of three. Don't worry, there will be two to follow. I'll announce them this year. Um, we exist to shift power to women, trans and non-binary people in tech with a focus on black, indigenous and people of color and to ensure that the tech industry is an engine for and not against equity and economic justice. We're focused in three spheres over five years. One is industry, academia, and finally innovation and entrepreneurship. And I can take you through our goals. In industry, we're looking to increase the number of technical um, women, trans and non-binary in the workforce. That might mean what you can think of as a computer programmer, but it can also mean a systems engineer. It can mean a product manager. It can mean a data scientist. And in our world in Chicago, I see in all 20 of our top industries, the underpinning of technology. So when I think of the engineering foundation, this is something where um, it's very much turning into a hybrid of engineering and technology. In academia, we're focused at University of Illinois at Chicago on increasing the number of computer science um, graduates out of their, their program that are women, trans and non-binary. And finally, we're looking to direct uh, more capital, venture debt or other sources of equity toward majority owned women um, owned companies. Next slide. And so even when I think about the fact that there's uh, women and other um, marginalized genders in the workforce, I think of those companies. So currently in the United States, 42% of the businesses are owned by women. 64% of new women-owned businesses are started by women of color. In 2019, women-founded startups took in 2.7% of all venture capital. So $2.70 of $100. And in 2020, um, it's actually sobering in the last month, it's been revealed that that's actually dropped to 2.2%. I think with COVID-19 and what we're seeing right now with the losses in um, women overall, this is even more important. Um, I came into this job with the role of increasing the number in the workforce. And I think all of us can feel the pain of, we're now looking to retain or build up to that original 2019, 2020 numbers. So I think all of us as a community in this, these STEM fields have a lot of work we can do together. Next slide. So we're concentrating on a variety of interventions, but I wanted to bring one here today that I think really aligns with the work of the Chicago Engineers Foundation. Um, I'm really um, happy to pronounce um, to present the inaugural uh, GET Fellowship. It's a fellowship focused on the first five years of a technical woman, trans and non-binary person's career. We did a lot of research. We realized there were a lot of pipeline programs, a lot of recruitment from college into a, into a company, but that first rung was the missing rung. So you have a lot of leadership, you have manager programs, you have VP, you have programs concentrating on getting people onto boards. I'm not saying those are complete. I'm saying there's a huge lack of um, leadership there as well. But we thought, what about that first promotion? You know, thinking about this event in E-Week, what are those events and resources and mentors that get that first career to the next, you know, 20 years of someone's life at a, at a company? So during that fellowship, we've, we've kind of made it an Ocean's Eleven. I think all you engineer, uh, the engineering community will like this. We're taking different um, product managers, software developers, quality assurance engineers, data scientists, and we're combining them to multidisciplinary teams and seeing how they work together to form um, a new app, a new platform, a new research project. And when I think of the first couple of years of my career, and if I was given this opportunity, um, 
I'm not saying there's going to be a startup started in this initiative, but I, I, I feel like I should watch a lot of these individuals very closely. We're also providing career mentorship um, and workshops, and we're also expanding the community um, in the Chicago tech ecosystem. Oftentimes you start your job at one company, um, you're doing your networking, you have your employee resource group at your own organization. Um, just like this organization, how do we branch that out? How do you meet um, individuals from other companies? How do you know um, what's available to you uh, in, this, in the Chicago-wide ecosystem? Next slide. And so I think one thing that we're very proud of is um, over 50% of these um, individuals are self-taught. So that's another thing that I think is an interesting component of um, people are entering the tech field from different arenas. And I'm sure that um, you think about master's programs in engineering, you know, someone who started in English might ultimately end up in this space as well. 85% are non-white and 30% are LGBTQ. And so uh, I think the diversity is very powerful. In my interviews, when we were setting up Get Cities, uh, several companies in Chicago, you know, they might only have one Latinx woman. They might only have one black woman. And so the ability to combine and meet each other in our city is something that um, I'm hoping to provide that space. Next slide. And so I'd love to invite you all to get involved or if you have a, a young person in your life or a, even a grandmother in your life that's very interested in technology, anyone who's interested, we're doing a series of career talks that are mirroring the journey that our fellows are taking. It's in partnership with IC Stars, which is an entrepreneurial um, kind of accelerator uh, in Chicago led by Sandy Castro. And so I presented these dates um, we have one on your finding your tech north star, finding your voice, and then building your community. So leveraging your network, um, looking to just broaden and uh, expand this space. And I think as we watch STEM, I think STEM is getting increasingly um, just more diversified and exciting. So delighted to be here, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Elle. And now I am pleased to introduce our next speaker. Barbara Guthrie has been helping ensure safe, sustainable, and secure living and working environments for people around the globe. Through her 35 years of experience in safety science research, regulatory code, standards development, laboratory operations, product and system certifications, training, and education. As VP of Corporate Sustainability, Barbara is the visionary responsible for UL sustainability strategy across the global landscape expanding and elevating its commitment to social, environmental, and sustainability services and offerings. She leads UL employees on a shared mission to positively impact the planet, its people, and prosperity while working for a safer, more secure, and sustainable world. Barbara holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Electrical Engineering and an MBA from Roosevelt University. Welcome, Barb. And before you begin your presentation, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked Elle. If you could be any superhero, which would you be and why? So much and thanks everyone online. Um, superhero, I would say it's Dr. Jane Foster from the Thor Dark World. And later on in my presentation, I think I'll help you to all understand why. So I'll leave that as a little teaser. But I start off by saying, hello everyone, welcome. Um, I am Chicago born and raised and I'm delighted to be here. And in some ways, uh, this is interesting because instead of having to deal with the February Chicago coming downtown and having the pleasure of seeing you all in person at a luncheon, now we're virtual. So I almost feel like those of you who remember Bozo Circus and Garfield Goose, a little romper room where I could actually look out and see all of you. So unfortunately, this is what we have. And I thank you all again for joining us and looking really forward to the Q and A's later on when we can all really virtually get together. Um, as mentioned, I'm with UL Underwriters Laboratory, and I expect maybe some of you will have seen our mark out there on products and systems. Um, we actually authorize 21 billion of these marks on products each year that help to keep your homes safe, secure, and sustainable. We are a company that actually was founded in Chicago um, at the founding of the 1893 World's Fair of the Columbian Exhibition. In fact, at that time, our founder, William Henry Merrill, was a, a MIT, MIT graduate, MIT graduate and Boston inspector. And there was question if this white city was safe for visitors. And there was some hesitation on issuing the certificate of occupancy. So William Henry Merrill was called over to Chicago to inspect the fair and make certain that it was safe for visitors, global visitors and for the Chicago city, loved Chicago and then stayed in Chicago 
and this became our headquarters. Next slide. So what is really behind that, that mark? And sometimes I like to think about it as the Willy Wonka chocolate factory. You know, what goes on behind the closed UL doors? Well, UL is a laboratory, hence our name. And what we do is we test and certify products for safety, sustainability, and security. We're a global company. We are in nearly 100 countries around the world, um, but yet our headquarters is in the greater land of Chicago in Northbrook. Uh, we employ 1,500 employees, of which about 70% are engineers, technicians, uh, scientists, uh, mathematicians, and really that STEM field is the science and the basis and the foundation of our company and has been for now our 127 years. What do we do? We test and certify products. I like to think about it as we push products to the limit. We blow them up, we torch them, we implode them, we explode them. We put them to the severe weathering conditions that we see in Chicago, both in heat and in fire. We bomb them with different types of frequencies and waves, all in a controlled laboratory, responsible, repeatable environment so that when you're using those products in your home, you know they are safe and your families are safe. So with that, it's kind of what brought me to UL. Next slide. So I joined UL in 1894 um, after graduating from Bradley University um, as an electrical engineer that was shared. Uh, now in the bottom corner of the picture, there I am circled in red, um, the only uh, engineering woman in my graduating class. And that was not uncommon at the time. Um, interesting too, there I am, oh, back a slide, I'm sorry. There I am sporting the engineering uniform, the men's tailored black wool suit, the white starched blouse and the bow tie, if you will. And that's pretty much um, what a woman engineer uh, graduating in 1984 was expected to look like and had to look like to secure the job. Uh, the uniform probably was pretty much used to it. As you've seen, I went to 12 years of wearing a uniform through school. I wanna take you a little back to my first day on Bradley University's campus. And first of all, um, and I was venturing out of my dorm room wearing jeans. Now this is, was unheard of. Even when we had non-uniform days at Trinity and St. Bernardine School and, and River Forest and Forest Park, you never wore jeans. So there I am wearing jeans, walking across campus and going into my first class in Olin Hall, which was physics. And so down the stairs of Olin Hall, um, carrying my books, feeling ready to embark on this, this new journey of my life and opening the door to a sea of faces, all faces of guys. Now coming from an all girls school, wearing a uniform, wearing jeans and having all guys in the classrooms was nothing short of a cultural shock and probably one of many cultural shocks I had to experience throughout my career as a woman engineer. Um, and time progressed. Now, don't, do not get me wrong. Don't think that in any way, shape or form, this was a hardship. I mean, I loved college life. And I feel so often one of the important things is it's not about a balance, it's a blend. Balance infers that you're, you're actually compromising one or the other. No, I like to blend it and I did blend it quite skillfully. Um, there's no question I had to work hard as an engineering student. In fact, probably putting on myself, I had to work harder. I had to make certain to prove to myself that I had a place at the table. I could be an engineer. I had to make sure that no one doubted why I was there or how I got there. I had to prove myself to be an equal. Doesn't mean I didn't enjoy college. In fact, um, I think I very appropriately and skillfully, if you will, blended my studies and happy hours, if you will, of doing other things in good times. Um, but it was difficult. And I knew that being that one woman, I felt um, I carried this burden of making certain that I had a right to be there and I could be there. Um, a little thing I wanna talk about is, as we went through our four years of college, Senior year, Bradley offered this one credit hour class. It was called Interview because they were a great school to make certain that you graduated with a career in your field. So as 
every senior did, we signed up for that one credit hour, how to interview. And still, 37 years later, I think back to the three lessons that I learned during that interviewing class. The first lesson, respond to the recruiter as if it is your dream job. And I worked that and respond. In fact, to each interview I had, I had a job offer. It was up to me to choose where I wanted to work because I made certain they knew I was passionate and that was the company I wanted to work for. Great lesson. Lesson number two, dress for success. And you can see what that meant was you put on that wool suit, you put on the hose, you put on the blouse and you show them that you are truly ready to be a professional engineer in the field. The third lesson, which I don't think many, in fact, I'm pretty certain not another one of my classmates heard this lesson. And it was do not wear your engagement ring during the interview. Yeah, you heard me right. Do not wear that engagement ring during the interview. Next slide. Now, some of you are aghast. Some of you can't believe that was actually told to a young lady graduating in engineering. And some of you were thinking it's completely unacceptable. But the reality is, it was timely advice. It was right for the time. And I did get my dream job, working for UL and working for a safer world. Now I wanna share some really cool things that I've been able to promote, to engage in and to power when it comes to young women and young people in engineering. How did I blend successfully my work and life passions? Do you understand it has been a journey? It's been a marathon. It is certainly not a sprint. And I like to think of life as a game of shoots and ladders. For those of you who remember the child's game, shoots and ladders. You take the ladder up and at times you come up to a shoot or a slide that brings you back down and you find the other ladder and you keep building up. And, and that's, that's the life journey is to keep excelling and finding the ladders. Also, when you find a chute, take it, ride it out and then find another ladder up. So next slide, here's one of my journeys. So in the late nineties, I was offered the opportunity to move to Denmark. At that time, UL had recently acquired Demco which was the equivalent of UL in Denmark. It was the national certification body. And I was asked to go over and run the company. Now, this definitely um, caused me a bit of nervousness. Not that I didn't think I could actually do the job. I actually was very involved in global certifications and testing. I understand both the European and the global standards that was used. Um, I was part of the due diligence team that acquired the company and made many visits and really you know, felt comfortable knowing the people, what this meant to UL and to get us into the European certification scheme. Yet I was extremely nervous. And the reason I was nervous was at that time, I was a single mom with two boys, Zach and Justin, two and three years old. It wasn't that I couldn't handle the job. It was, what are people gonna think about me taking on this job? Who am I to leave my country, to drag two little boys alone to another country? What are they thinking of me? I felt like I was wearing the scarlet letter upon my chest. But fast forward, long and the short is, sold the house, packed up Jack, Zach and Justin, and on we went to this adventure. Shoots and ladders. After about a month um, in Copenhagen, I was actually going through the McDonald's drive-thru with Zach and Justin in the car seats in the back seat. And for all of you traveling, you know, with kids, we all love our McDonald's and those kids needed their Happy Meal, a little bit of home. So when I got up to the window um, at the McDonald's, the young girl passing the food said to me, hey, you're that lady from the newspaper. And let me fill you in a few days back, a news crew came out to the house. They wanted to interview me about being the first executive director, this American executive director from Demco, their national certification body. And they want to take pictures of the house, take pictures of the boys and me goofing around and, and doing their thing. So right away, I tell you, my gut clenched up. 
I was feeling the shoot flying down the slide, the judgment. What are you doing coming here with your two small boys? You don't even speak the language, leaving them with a foreign country, leaving their family behind. My mind quickly spun out of control, the guilt, the seconds seemed like a lifetime. And then the young girl at the window who had said, hey, you're that lady from the newspaper. And she continued, wow, so cool. Welcome to Denmark. So then I realized what we fear is often what we bring upon ourselves. I simply loved my time in Denmark. The Danish people are incredibly welcoming, adaptive, open individuals. In fact, Danes rarely get married when they raise their families. There is no tax advantage. In fact, it's often a tax penalty. And then when you think about it, Denmark is run by a queen, Queen Marguerite. Queen Marguerite, her husband is a prince. She is the bloodline and heir to the monarchy. Next slide. And I returned to the US in 2000 as the vice president for education outreach. The first vice president of education outreach for UL. I kind of was able to create my own position. Um, the position was to develop programs to educate young people about safety, science, and UL. The perfect job, again, blending a mom and an engineer. Soon after I began and came back, we all know 9-11 hit and it hit us hard. Our world changed as we know it. With you all being all about safety, I thought, you know, maybe there's more we can do as a company to address 9-11, to address consumer confidence. And at the time I had a friend that worked at Walt Disney. In fact, he was an Imagineer, very cool position. And I had worked with him to do some certification of Disney products and food carts. So I gave him a call and I said, you know, things are going on. And it's, you know, this, this world as we know it has shifted. I knew that Disney had safety as one of their key pillars. And I also knew that Disney for the first time in their history had evacuated the parks because of 9-11. So I thought maybe together we could work and address safety, consumer safety. And again, try to get this world back to as we know it. Fast forwarding two years later, UL opened a 4,000 square foot exhibit in Epcot called Test the Limits Lab. And this is where we helped people understand the science behind safety, instilling that consumer confidence once again. That same year, we also launched what is known as the Safety Smart Program. This is a program where Timon and Pumba, our beloved safety ambassadors, um, stars of the Lion King, many of you may remember, um, were there to help us educate young children between the ages of four and 11 about safety. What we did was we created eight animations featuring Timon and Pumbaa, uh, Disney style, edutaining, song and dance, lessons on fire safety, home safety, safety online, uh, character counts, um, green stewardship for our planet, online safety. All of these animations were complemented with a teacher's guide correlated to national standards and a parent's guide to talk about some of these topics as parents. And importantly, what we created was an ambassador guide. So we could have our employees and Disney employees volunteer and go out to schools and teach the program. 17 years later, it's still something I'm amazed at that this program now in 34 languages around the globe has been seen by over 1 billion kids and is actually written into law in the UAE as a mandatory curriculum. It's been a wild ride, as they like to say at Disney, an e-ride. We also worked to address middle school science in creating what was called Safety Smart Science with, you'll see on the screen, Bill Nye, the science guy. Yes, Bill came out to UL on multiple occasions and filmed fire safety, water safety, healthy and fit electrical safety again, to really engage young people in how science is cool, fun, and for everyone. Those also came with the Teacher's Guide, Ambassador's Guide, and is still running strong and can be sought after online. You all really stayed committed to the field of STEM in young people, and we're very excited to partner with Disney, Doby Laboratories, and the National Science Foundation in what was called the Ultimate Mentor Adventure, which promoted young girls in STEM. 
high school girls from around the country were able to send in a two minute video about what is their own STEM career aspirations and who in their lives are helping mentor them and seek to fulfill and aspire to that aspiration. The prize for 10 young ladies was a trip to California for a full week, spend a day behind the scenes at Disney, spend a day in Dolby Labs, and we got to host them for a day at our UL offices, really being a UL engineer. At the end of the week, these young ladies got to walk the red carpet at the premiere of the 2013 Thor The Dark World, which featured, as mentioned earlier, my hero, Natalie Portman, as Dr. Jane Forrester, the American physicist that helps to find and save Thor from the earth. These 10 winners got to meet Natalie Portman, even Chris Helmsworth, and yes, I was there too, definitely a ladder in my life and a, and a ladder in so many of these girls' lives. So who's my favorite superhero? I have to admit, Dr. Jane Foster and all that that comes with. Um, to wrap up, we're here celebrating National Engineers Week, which again, to me is all about the blending, blending today's activity and blending what I've done in my past National Engineering. For many, many years, I was down at Walt Disney World, Florida, celebrating National Engineering Week, having, hosting engineering demonstrations for a lot of young kids. This was one of those moments where we were allowed to do it, but don't try this at home because we are professionals. And each year, Zach and Justin, those two boys, were able to join me down at Disney, um, having some family fun time, and very importantly, hearing day in, day out, how fun it is and how cool it is to aspire to having a career in engineering. Fast forward, one of my proudest moments as a mom was seeing my son Zach graduate as an environmental engineer who now certifies green products for who? For UL. Next slide. I think we still have a few minutes. So I wanna share uh, one other really exciting, engaging, and empowering way that UL gets involved in young people in STEM and celebrating engineering. And particularly with this being Engineering Week, I wanna talk about UL's partnership with FIRST Robotics. Uh, all of you listening today, this is really an incredible way to get involved. Whether you're a business leader, whether you're an engineer yourself, a parent, a student, um, just interested in engineering, this is a phenomenal program with proven success to engage, empower, and really get everyone excited about science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Uh, one would say this is the Super Bowl of science. It was founded in 1989 by Dean Kamen. You may not know Dean's name, but I'm sure you know one of his many inventions, the Segway. We often see them riding around Chicago. Um, first, which is for inspiration and recognition of science and technology is one of the leading youth serving nonprofits advancing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. You have partnered with FIRST over 15 years ago as their exclusive safety partner. Since then, hundreds of my colleagues from UL serve as safety advisors at their competitions. They use their, their paid volunteer time off to be a part of this incredible organization and the Super Bowl of Science. Our employees also serve as mentors as well as coaches for many of the safety teams around the globe. We've also served as panel speakers. As a company, we continue to be the host of the UL Safety Award and are responsible for managing the first robotics animation competition. This is really cool where kids create animations on the chosen theme and submit them for judging. This year's theme was sharing is caring, promoting diversity, inclusion, and equity for all as part of the fundamental principles of FIRST Robotics. If you wanna make an impact, promote STEM, and give our young people life tools, I really encourage so many of you to look up first and see how you can get involved. Next slide. So whether it's FIRST, whether it's safety smart Disney programs, whether it's walking the red carpet with Natalie Portman, there are so many ways to get involved and to get your own engineers, your own colleagues, your peers, and your leaders involved. 
What's important and what's underpinning to all of this is to remain inclusive, fair, respectful of one another. As we say at UL, it's no longer about the golden rule, treat others as you'd like to be treated. What we like to say is treat others as they wish to be treated. Let's all work together to empower the next generation of engineers to be their best, to give their best and better our world. To close, I'd like to thank all of you online for your patience and your attention. This is never how we like to meet and greet one another. Thank you all for your interest and your passion in engineering. I certainly want to thank the Chicago Engineering Foundation for hosting this event and for the many teams of people behind the scenes that made this all possible. Thank Al, my co-panelists, really inspirational words and incredible needed and worthy programs going on today. And the spirit of National Engineers Week, thanks all of you engineers, you scientists, you mathematicians, everyone out there that truly has the innovation, the creativity, the commitment to STEM and is making a better world for all of us. I do look forward to our future powered by the next generation of women, of men and of bright people, bright minds. Thank you all. Thank you, Barb. Uh, and I, I have to um, say that when I learned about the videos that you all produce for children about safety, I definitely shared them with my sisters to show it to my nephews and nephews. <laughs> uh, and they, they really enjoyed it. Great. So thank you for that. Um, so now it's time to uh, do some Q&A with our speakers. Uh, and before we do, I'll share my superhero as well, which would be Captain Marvel because Captain Marvel is just all around strong and determined. Um, I also wanted to share a little bit about myself and what inspired me to become an engineer and what I hope to do to inspire the next generation. Uh, for me, I can attest that my, in my interest in engineering came from a series of things. Uh, I enjoyed math, I enjoyed reading and writing and when I did a writing project for a sophomore English class, I read a novel about an architect and the novel, the novel described the importance of buildings and infrastructure and described them as vital and key to a functioning society. It helped me think about how I could help bring something good to society through learning about buildings and the infrastructure that we need most. So that that interest combined with my success at mathematics and I got, a, I got first place at a computer, aid, uh, computer aided drafting regional competition. So it, it just became a natural fit. And I, I also um, attended an engineering camp for young women at Southern Illinois University. And that was very reinforcing to my interest as well. So I held on to my interest from sophomore year all the way to when it came time to actually apply to schools and uh, pick a degree. And so I ended up getting my undergraduate degree at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in civil engineering. And I hope to help inspire the next generation to see the importance, the value, and creativity that you can find in engineering. So let's, uh, we'll get started with our questions. Um, I have developed some questions in advance, and you are all welcome to ask some questions as, as well. So please use the chat feature and we will get to as many as possible. Uh, and I'll ask a, a couple just to get us started. Hey, Debbie, do you wanna turn off the presentation and then we can uh, widen out the uh, mode for all of the cameras? Thank you, Debbie. Uh, so here's my first question. Um, when I was a high school freshman, my high school was being rebuilt. And one day my geometry teacher started the class by pouring out all this admiration for seeing a woman architect on site wearing a hard hat. I left class thinking that wearing a hard hat was cool. And it is another of the key memories that I, I mentioned that led me towards choosing to study engineering. So from, um, from your career and personal experience, what have you seen inspire young women to study engineering? And this question goes to both Barb and Elle, and we'll start with Barb. 
In fact, I love that. Um, hard hats are cool. There's no getting around it. I like to say every girl needs a hard hat and a tiara. Why not? But when you said that, you know, it, it kind of, it, it brought me back, uh, Becky, because my dad was an engineer and he worked for Illinois Bell for nearly 50 years. And he always had his hard hat um, in the car. And when I worked for UL, I was given my UL hard hat. And I have to admit, I drove around with it in my car because I thought it was so cool to see a hard hat in someone's car. So <laughs> whatever it is that inspires, um, I think go for it. When we did the, the Thor mentor, we brought those 10 uh, young inspirational ladies uh, to UL. I made certain every one of them left with a hard hat with their name on it in the UL mark so that they too could be inspired by hard hats. That's awesome. Thank you, Barb. Al, would you like to um, uh, touch on this? Sure. So I think one thing that I've been seeing with my conversations with um, young professionals and students is I get a lot of calls that say, I want to be in tech. And so I really try to drill down onto what kind of problem or what products are you interested in working on? And so it may be um, talking about, um, for me, like public transportation systems. Is it something where you're very annoyed by how late your train is and could you make that a little faster? Um, it could be something with the environment where you're frustrated that the beach near your home is degrading. Is that something where you'd be, it'd be worth your time to understand ways to do like climate shoring up. So I think it's really also making it a relevant application to something in um, a woman's life. And that can be uh, kind of blending an interest they have with the idea of engineering. Because engineering can seem kind of daunting, but when you really do break down the practical applications, um, it gets kind of exciting because you're like, I really could work on the thing that annoys me the most and I could make an impact on the world. Great, thanks for your insights. Um, so here's my second question. Um, there's a lot of news right now about women leaving the workforce, especially women who are mothers. On October 2nd, 2020, NPR reported that January of 2020 was a milestone wherein more women than men held jobs in the U.S. for the first time in a decade. But of course, the pandemic has erased those gains, and it's unclear how long it might take for women to come back to work. Uh, so this question goes to Elle first, and then we'll go to Barb. Um, what would you encourage business leaders to do to help retain women in engineering? So I think this is a really sobering time. Um, it's been over 2 million women since the beginning of COVID-19. Uh, there are just um, factors that no one ever anticipated. Um, I think the, the biggest one is this, um, you know, I even felt it, I'm a, I'm a new mother and this idea of this uh, social pressure that if, if needed, if there are two individuals that the woman, it's in the back of their mind that they'll, they'll take their job down if, if needed. And so if there are ways for companies or I've been talking to the governor and the mayor about this, um, if there aren't virtual opportunities, um, like there are virtual opportunities for school, but are there ways for per pod schooling for ways to make sure that a company is ensuring childcare? Like this might be the time for in, in-house corporate childcare um, or also just a little bit more flexibility where you're realizing that everyone is doing a 24 seven programming of their entire lives. But it's, it's, it's not the only factor, but it's definitely one where you're just seeing, I've been talking to the mom project. It's just a very intense um, time and giving them some grace and flexibility, I think very much can help. Well, I think you, you definitely, I mean, this COVID has so brought all of this forth. And, and when, I, when I think about what can anybody do, even what, what can companies do, but really important, what can individual leaders do? You know, I think at growing up and in, in being an engineer and in the workforce, you know, it was very common, uh, if you will, Monday morning, hey, did you watch the game last night? You know, guys had this camaraderie. Oh, and of course they watched the game. Of course they talked about the game. But you know, that, that hesitation of, did I say, oh, my kid was sick and I was up all night with them? Or, oh, I was planning for the family birthday party. Somehow it meant that then maybe my priorities weren't work first. Maybe, you know, um, I'm not right to speak today because I've been up all night and I've been actually, you know, my mind isn't in the game. And 
these constant challenges, kind of back to that, don't wear your engagement ring, you know, let the company think they are first and foremost, because that's what they expected. But instead of saying, so what did you do? And, and how well-rounded you are and how much you are truly blending all that you are, because all of these talks now about inclusion in diversity in equity brings all minds to the table because everyone's mind and every thing that makes us, I like to think about as our DNA, probably the science side of me, but within our DNA, how do we process is who brings all ideas to the table. And if everyone is exactly the same and everyone's talking and looking and feeling the exact same way, we're not going to be innovative. We're not going to be creative. We're not going to be adaptable. We're probably not going to find the best solution out there. So as a leader, let everyone be who they are. Ask them what's going on. Talk to them. Encourage. How are your kids doing? It, it amazes me that it's like some secret taboo topic. I think of that Folgers commercial, which I do love the Folgers commercials, you know, watching the kids shovel snow when you're all warm. But that one new commercial where the mom is like this because her kid keeps popping up in the screen. We have kids at home. Let it be. It's not wrong. Engage the kids. The dog is going to bark during a Zoom call. Introduce the dog to your family. But more importantly, even when we get back to the workplace, really learn who your people are professionally and personally. Let them blend it together. You will get the best and the most out of them when they can bring their genuine, true self to work. Thank you. That was very well said. Um, I do have one more question, but I also see that we have some questions in the chat, so I'll save mine for later. Um, so let's go to some from the chat. Debbie, what do we have? So the first question is for Elle regarding Get Cities. How does one apply for the fellowship? Thank you so much for that question. So um, we opened our fellowship applications for 2021 last um, November. But what we're going to be doing is extending a public showcase that I'll definitely pass to the Chicago Engineers Foundation. Um, that will be in September, and then we'll open applications in October for the next year. It's a nine month, and it's actually, we believe, um, uh, I think this is unique uh, in the fellowship space. We're actually paying the fellows $5,000 for their extra effort. So it's, it's, um, it's above the, um, their workload. Um, so it was, I think, a very popular application because of the extra money. Um, so I will let everyone know when that opens again. And this is a question for either of our speakers today or Becky as well. Um, what is the best ways or what are some recommendations you have for engaging local media who maybe aren't talking enough about eWeek and how do we get students and parents and other community members aware of eWeek programs and ways to engage students in uh, engineering early on? I'll take it as, first of all, thank you to the Chicago Engineering Foundation. I mean, first of all, we can host so many of these virtual events and in-person events when COVID stops, but let's celebrate it. Let's rebroadcast it. You know, what we like to do at UL is say thank you to those you know. And I never thought Engineers Week was just about engineers. It's to celebrate the engineers, the parents that help get the kids through engineering school, the young people that are considering careers in it, we have so many opportunities with social media today that we can shout it from the rooftops, talk about it, engage, and also uh, use that as a chance to really, mentor is a funny word to me because it always seems so structured and controlling, but talk about it. I often, very often, help some of my UL colleagues and talk to their kids, boys and girls alike. It doesn't matter about what it's like to be in engineering, not underplay the, the um, what it takes, it takes hard work, but also share um, all the good things that come about. I never wanted to be an engineer in a lab coat locked in a corner, and I certainly have never been that. So really talk about it and use all we have available with the great communication skills to celebrate it. Others? <laughs> I'm trying to think of what to say. <laughs> um, I, I, I think there's always more we can do. Um, and we're learning how to operate in this, this virtual environment. And um, 
Here's my, my cat just <laughs> Hey, this is Bart. <laughs> I, uh, I try to give them extra food so they would be um, fine. <laughs> Leave me alone for a little bit. Um, but I, I think that the, trying to get kids at home, um, in school, and in giving parents and tools, uh, parents and teachers the tools they need um, to, to communicate with the kids. I think that- um, With the menu on the right. This and and I, I think that like with safety, like seeing the videos that you all put out for safety, um, you know, I think something like that for engineering would really um, engage kids and help kids see um, just, you know, it, and when we're talking about diversity, um, you know, getting uh, engineers in Chicago to just say, I am, I am a civil engineer and help just kind of paint, give um, role models for kids is really important. Um, I, I recently discovered for myself that there are many careers that I never considered because the moment I imagined it, um, I just, I couldn't imagine myself. I, I have an image of um, just a guy doing it. And if it, if it was just, if I only ever saw guys doing it, it just, it was like, well, then it can't be interesting. <laughs> um, but as soon as I saw like a woman doing it, I'm like, wow, that must be really cool. Like if a woman is doing it, that must be a really cool thing to do. So I think giving kids an opportunity to see somebody like themselves do it is really important. And it's one of my missions is to ex expose as many um, young people as possible to the ideas of who they can be. No, um, Becky, you, had, you had mentioned, I was gonna say, you know, talking to the kids. And one of the things UL has done is we have as part of our um, social um, sustainability. We give all employees 16 hours, two full paid days off a year, and we've extended the program. So we tell them, if you want to go into the schools, your kid's school, your niece's school, and talk about engineering, that's a good volunteer activity. Try to use the skills you have, the information, you know, what you're passionate about. It's not just volunteering, which is great for the Red Cross for other activities, but also mentoring, talking to visiting schools and talk about engineering. And I think more companies can really extend their possible volunteer time off to really um, empower and engage engineering and science oh, within the schools. I'm very sad that Children's Museum is closed right now. I am not child aged, but um, there's an area where they challenge you to build a skyscraper to a certain height. Um, I've spent hours doing this at my age and so one thing I was thinking for eWeek in this time, um, I run another initiative around urban planning. We sent um, do-it-yourself kits about an urban plan. Like people had blocks and they could arrange them and take pictures of a Rogers Park site. So one thing is everyone's trapped at home for COVID-19. And so what could also be fun for eWeek is something that's more of a, like build a bridge across your bathtub or um, stop, stop your garden from flooding using recyclables. I don't know, but I just know that uh, as someone who goes to the Children's Museum and has friends, kids with me so I can build skyscrapers, uh, I think that could be such a fun, the kind of live thing for people to experience. Um, where is the Children's Museum? Navy oh, Pier. Navy Pier, it's a must see. Okay, yeah, I don't think I've been, so I can't wait for that to reopen. Um, I do hear we have another question from the chat, Debbie. So how do we adjust the perception of some early general engineering classes, some uh, such as some of the calculus and the gen ed uh, classes as the weed out classes? Um, this person is saying, I know many students left engineering because of their grades in those classes, despite a passion for the subject. Those subjects are important, but sometimes they're less essential for certain subdisciplines of our profession. I'm someone who personally um, dropped, uh, I started in economics and the science and math versus the liberal arts, something where I regret not having statistics and not having more um, civil background and, and what, my, what I work on. And one thing I think is kind of missing is there's no engineering sampler course at the, at the beginning. There's always the gen eds, but there's never, uh, in liberal arts, you always get to try a bunch of different history. And, and I almost wish there's something where you could try maybe every three weeks switching a discipline on just an intro, because I think unfortunately gen eds just are not gonna hook you um, the same way as, uh, wow, I really need to devote my life to environmental engineering. 
I really think that's great, Elle, because yeah, you kind of sign up in engineering and you have 16 hours nonstop in one discipline. I know they talk a lot about the convergence programs where you get exposed to other things. And I think universities have to look at, in fact, as an employer, I mean, we want well-rounded individuals and the well-rounded individuals has the backbone of some finance, some business, some marketing and different engineering disciplines. I mean, even when Becky was talking about city planning, you, you have to recognize all that it's involved and that's how you bring your best self to the workplace. So I know companies would definitely welcome that type of um, shift in the curriculum. It's a lot of hours, we know, but yet what's really important is that you are graduating with the ability to do well and do well in your field. And it's definitely lacking right now. And, and I'd like to also advocate for um, engineers to get to get some of that liberal arts education. I think ethics is really important for engineers to learn and also to, um, to get some idea of uh, other disciplines and um, have respect and, and, and see the value in everything that they've, they've learned. Um, as engineers, we like to solve problems and, but sometimes our, our field is limited to, you know, the physics or the materials of it. And so I think it's really important for engineers to work with other disciplines so that we can face not only the, the science as like the, how the science can help the problem, but also recognize how engineers can work with other disciplines like planners and um, po uh, policy makers in terms of making solutions that are gonna be uh, sus sustainable and good for in the long, long term. You know, a little side story, which again, sometimes you can't believe these things, but when our engineering group, we had to take engine speech for engineers. We did not take the regular liberal arts speech course, which would have taught us public speaking, how to do a Zoom interview and all the <laughs> other things. No, we were allowed to take the, the side course for engineers, which meant you basically read a speech on some cards and there was no personality required. There was no creativity, no innovation required. Well, I can't say that really set us up to succeed in today's world, so. Um, do we have any other questions from the chat, Debbie? Not at this time. Okay, so I'll ask my, uh, one of my other questions. Um, and maybe we already touched on some of this in the conversation we've already had. Uh, but I found that I, um, I found this Harvard Business Review article, and I thought it was really interesting the way that they described um, helping women stay in the engineering field choose to stay. And what they found is that when managers were able to help women believe in their own competence and potential for leadership, when they provided a sense of belonging and demonstrated role models balancing work and non-work, Managers could be successful in allowing women in engineering actually imagine themselves as engineers, even though they were already engineers. I think it gave them a sense of belonging and uh, ownership over their role. Um, they, and they highlighted specific tactics such as stretch assignments, constructive personalized feedback, an inclusive microenvironment, and role models who demonstrate work-family balance. So thinking, um, I'll start with We'll start with Barb, but thinking back over your career, what have you seen or experienced managers getting right in fostering women in engineering? Yeah, thanks, Becky. And obviously you've hit on it and we've talked about it. I think of one particular example though, I had talked about our relationship with FIRST Robotics and the program was going on and I mean, it's a great program. And then I was responsible. I took over responsibility for managing it. And this is, Again, something that you wouldn't think about if you actually weren't one of the women that served as the advisors. So we provided, if you will, gear for all of our employees that went out, a couple hundred as safety advisors. And they were these green polo shirts that were all men's shirts. So here we were as a young girl, and I'm not a 2X, I can assure you, and I had to wear a men's polo shirt to these events. Now, first of all, this, this wasn't really fair to us. I couldn't even imagine any of the guys that would have wore women's shirts. But then here we are with young people. Um, in these events, again, 40,000, this was the Super Bowl. 
and we're wearing these boxed heavy polo shirts. It's a little thing. Yes, we so supported everyone can be a safety advisor at First Robotics. Everybody can go out and, and do this. But yet even the gear they gave us to wear was men's gear. And it, it's it's a little thing, but it, it, and again, it, it you have to sit back and remember, would the same be true of a guy? I mean, don't wear your engagement ring. You may not be committed. A follow up to that story in a true part. When I actually got married, my manager said that was the best thing you ever could have done, Barb, because now they believe you're committed to staying around. Now, I can imagine they said that to other guys. We just have to think, we have to um, see it holistically. And again, bring everyone's best, genuine, honest self to the table. That's the bright mind that's gonna project us into the future. Thanks, Barb. Um, and Ala, do, have you seen anything um, through through your programs and through your personal and work experience about how, how managers can create a work environment that helps keep women in engineering? So I have been blessed. I've worked for three very powerful women managers, um, but I also want to address that I've worked for three very powerful and inclusive male managers. Um, and I don't think it's about being a woman. I think it's about um, being empathetic to different situations, family life. Um, I've had men that are my supervisors that talk about their family, um, respect weekend time. Uh, I don't, I think it's just um, like Barb, Barb said, do you have topics outside of sports? I mean, it, as a manager, if you don't know anything else but sports, maybe you read a book because I'm gonna also try to like think about the cup score and remember it from the weekend. So we're all just trying to, to remember things we can, we can connect on. And so I think that's been very helpful because I um, have not felt that awkward. I've had a couple of awkward moments, but generally I think the mentors in my life are, are co-ed, but they've never, um, they've never just shoehorned me into trying to just be uh, man-like. It's, it's more just, I'm just me. And I think that's been incredibly helpful because um, it doesn't feel like I have to just keep making myself a square if I'm a circle. Absolutely. I've definitely had to embrace that throughout my career as well. I started off um, in the railroad industry. And so, yes, <laughs> um, I, you know, even the dress code policies were for men. I mean, it didn't even say anything about women. I was just like, I, do I have to wear a tie? Like, I, I, I don't care. Like, I will just, it was almost like a joke to me. Just like, sure, I'll wear a tie, you know. <laughs> um, and, and then it, it's, uh, I think environment is very important for women. And it's definitely all about, like, allowing us to, to be who we are and be women in engineering. Um, I've often come across people shocked, like, oh, wow, you're a woman in engineering. And I'm like, yeah, I, but I know, I know so many, like, it's not, it's not shocking to me. Uh, I know hundreds of women in engineering. It's entirely normal. And um, I just hope someday that it'll, it'll be more normal, just like uh, a woman doctor um, or a woman journalist, all industries where it, it used to be dominated by men. And now we, we don't even really question it. Uh, <laughs> so. Becky, those um, Becky, those slides that you put up, I thought I thought the one that was really interesting was just how little progress had been made from 2007 to to 2017 in the number of women that are going to college. I'm so proud of CEF because over you know 47 percent of the scholarship recipients are women, and, and so for us, I think we're doing an outstanding job at least with gender. Um, I, I'm curious to know in terms of CEF's role and also how we're interacting with everyone in the room, whether or not there are other people out there that, you know, are, are, are there things that any of the groups here can be doing better uh, in your own industries? And um, I was just gonna suggest, and, you know, again, there's not that many people in the room. If you wanna just turn on their cameras and certainly uh, feel free to just speak, you're, you're welcome to do that.
Um, well, and that, that does bring me to another question I had, which was um, like considering all the efforts that have been made to attract women in engineering, surely some companies have had good intentions and yet been unsuccessful to attract or to retain women in engineering. So what, what do you wish companies would do differently? Don't give up. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, it's, 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 a, there's, it's gotta be a holistic approach. We know that we cannot have, um, we can't keep women in the workforce without having women in the workforce. Uh, when it comes to engineering, we know that kind of about fifth or sixth grade, um, that's when all, that's when in many cases, unfortunately, it doesn't matter if you're a young girl or a young man, you may drop out of the sciences. It's complicated. They're heavy books. You know, we have to keep that hands-on excitement engaging. I like to say, make engineering, you know, cool. Um, I think Bill Nye, the science guy, did a great job at that for a, um, sometimes an older generation. And we need things like that. I see a lot of YouTube videos. I mean, a lot of what's going on where we see what scientists do in these cold weathers with bubbles and other things. I mean, I think we just have to keep being very creative and engage them throughout it. I, I do know also... Um, when we did the Thor adventure and we turned off the cameras, we had all those young girls in the room in, um, up in our Brea office in California. And I brought in and flew in extra women engineers from Yale just, just to talk to these young girls. And these, are, these were high schoolers from around the country. And this is 2013, so it wasn't that long ago. But literally the girls asked if we ever went to a homecoming dance. And you know, you, you start to think, why is that such? Did you join the science club and were you made fun of? And we have to stop that early on. Um, whether you're man or woman and how you choose your career in advance, but we have to have the pipeline stronger. We really have to have all types getting into the sciences because that again will produce the best product in the end. And we can't have these stereotypes and these questions, but they were real. The girls felt this. They asked if you could get a manicure as an engineer. I mean. It's, it's the reality of what it is, and we just have to keep working at it and keep working at it. Because I think like you said, uh, Becky, until we don't have to mention it anymore, then the job's done. Um, so in my diversity inclusion space, one of the big things is the research of, for the Engineers Foundation, knowing how many people in your economy exist. Um, I'm not familiar with the numbers in engineering, but I came from architecture uh, in the United States there are 196 licensed black women architects in the entire country. And so when you're doing recruitment and you're, you're saying, I can't find anyone, that's true because every single one of those individuals in a certain subsector is taken, paid triple, no one's gonna let them go. So it's not only, um, I, I think Barb has a great point about how early you start, the way your business development team approaches client relations and tracking a project it's, it's giving those resources to sixth graders, but the sobering fact is even in my work, there are only 50,000 software developers in Illinois. That's all genders, all races. You may need to literally follow that sixth grader, like have them career day, go to high school, do a small internship, do college. I mean, it's something where if you're looking for that talent, you can't just put a job on LinkedIn because if, if it's like, let's say architects are there are 196 people, they're already, they already have a job. And so it's, it's almost the missing space of not just fostering them, but really knowing exactly almost who you've targeted and how they can end up and stay in your own companies. Absolutely. Um, Kay, I heard through the chat that you had something you wanted to share. Yes, I just recently read an article um, in an aviation magazine written by a young African-American aeronautical engineer. And she was telling the story of a mentor that she had had, someone that she worked directly with, it appeared from the article. And the thing that she advised us to do is to be brutally honest. And so she said the first startling thing that this man said to her one day was, because he was purposeful about helping her get ready for the workplace. He said to her, what are you going to do the first time somebody calls you a bitch? And then they talked about different ways that she could respond to it so that when and if it ever happened, 
she would be prepared. And I think that's kind of contrary to the way I've always counseled younger women because I've always believed it was a disservice to tell them any of the stories about discrimination that happened to me early in my career because it seemed like I was complaining and I've had a marvelous career. But by not telling them, I was not preparing them for the fact that it very likely was going to happen to them in some kind of a way. So um, it really helped me feel better about opening up about some kind of strange times in my in my career. So I, I felt like I learned a lot from that two page little article in a magazine. That's it. Yeah, um, I've I've read that one. And um, gosh, you know, it's it says a lot. I mean, it kind of balances this idea of both um, making sure that the company provides an inclusive environment, but also providing some guidance for any minority on how to operate and be successful within that group. So it's kind of a balance between uh, paying a little bit of attention to sports versus, or, you know, but also not feeling like you have to um, because they're gonna be inclusive anyway. And, you know, one thing I wish firms would, would stop doing is just hiring one woman and then thinking that now they, they've met their goal and that's it because, you know, it's so much more than, than that until there's like a critical mass of women or any type of minority group in an organization, you're not really gonna achieve um, an inclusive environment. Um, and I've definitely experienced that um, in, in my career. Um, but I, and, and then at the same time, you also mentioned this issue of like, do we, do we talk about the challenges we faced? And I, I, I would say for me, um, I went through U of I in my freshman year, we had this whole women engineering course and we, we learned etiquette and how to eat at a banquet. Um, and we learned, we got to meet um, older uh, and women engineers. And that was a question that we would ask, which would be like, oh, have you had any challenges? And, and I never got anything, it was always like, no, it's not a problem, never had an issue ever. So then when I started my career and I started like confronting things I've never had to deal with before, I was just like, what is happening? <laughs> so I do think that it's it's a tough call because um, I, I want the women younger than me to be prepared, but I also don't want them to think it's their problem. I don't want them to think it's a problem or a reason not to pursue it. They should pursue what they're interested in. So I. I don't have an answer. Why don't we go to one of the other? Um, so at Get Cities, we we have a systems map. It's every single social um, change we could think about while we're thinking about interventions. And one of them is kind of the psychosocial culture. So like how, it, how do people think about going to their job? And one of the ones I was struck with is, I think it is good to, to your point to hear some of these um, more grueling stories to just prepare until the whole system changed, as Rebecca said, we're still living in a system that's hard. Um, one of the ones that I was really reflecting on is I worked at a real estate firm for a, um, a woman partner, and there are not many real estate developers that are that are women. And she actually opened up about having to stay late, um, waiting outside of let's say um, like adult adult clubs for her male male counterparts. She gave up her pay increases because she had children, but she said she was glad she kept her job. And so she found out when she exited that company after 20 years how behind she was. But um, what I found powerful is I have also mm -hmm. noticed I have male colleagues that are not, um, don't ascribe to that same norm. So, you know, for example, I'll go to real, I would go to real estate functions and those, um, th there's a generation of women that feels like they have to stay till like two in the morning and, and maybe there's alcohol and, and steak at Chicago. So, but you're seeing even um, males my age and myself saying, you know what, it's, it's 10 PM, like we're okay, we'll go home. Um, and so I think, you know, both sides are kind of acknowledging there's been, it's been kind of an intense business world, but knowing where people came from, I mean, she's a very powerful mentor of mine, but she has really hard stories. And so then I also don't feel dispirited because if someone that in charge went through some really hard things, it, it every time I go through something hard or, or you tell me you went through something hard, it makes it easier for me to think, 
okay, I can keep going because I'm not the only one feeling this feeling. And I think that's probably why the truth or the transparency is so helpful. And the first time that I experienced a really tough issue of discrimination, because I hadn't been prepared for it, I believed I must have done something wrong. And so I kept thinking, well, I know I made that mistake on dam number two, but I worked through the weekend to correct my error in the math. And, and I just kept thinking, well, what did I do to be left off this team when I clearly should be part of it? And I struggled with my own ability to stay in engineering if I made a mistake that got me so kicked out of that team. And later I figured, I found out what it was and it was that the guy who set up the team didn't think it was appropriate to travel out of town with a woman and have to stay overnight in a hotel. And 10 years later, I told him, if I ever saw him treat a young woman engineer the way he had treated me, I would be after him because he had a problem and it wasn't supposed to impact my career because he had a personal problem. So we got that settled. It just took a decade. Yeah, and, and I, I think one thing about why it is important to share stories and maybe not necessarily, it doesn't have to happen in a public space, but at least um, between mentors and their mentees is that there is a script that it, I don't know how it happens, but I have shared stories with fellow women engineers, and we've been shocked at how two different men from two different companies said the same thing to an awesome young woman engineer that we both admired. <laughs> how, how is it that two different men in two different states had the exact same opinion of some young, smart, vibrant woman in engineering? It just, it, to me, it tells me that, okay, it helped Bella, like, it's not true. <laughs> um, it is definitely uh, the remnant of the, the society that it's just, it's a pattern. And so I think sh making sure that um, young women are prepared, but also empowered is really important. And Kay, I think you said something so importantly, it wasn't you. And we do put so much on ourselves and we think back and we revisit. And again, the problem was not yours, it was theirs. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And none of us wanna talk about how bad it is. And, and obviously it isn't because we're still in it, we're enjoying it, we've reaped the many benefits of it. Yet, sometimes to recognize it was what it was at that time. And it may not still occur today, but there's some aspect of it that, that, that is relevant and we still need to work on. But it certainly wasn't you. Yeah, Elle, I thought it was really striking the, the mention you had about the 2 million uh, lost jobs, so to speak, and uh, the fact that women were perceived to be the person who should have to stay home you know, to take care of the family. Um, two things. One, um, I was struck by a recent interview um, of a, a CEO who was interviewing this woman who had just been promoted into the upper ranks. And I, I would listen to the interview. It was an hour long interview and it began. And the second question the guy asked was, how did you balance your work and your family life? And I thought, you, just because in preparation for this, it was striking to me that I said, I wonder if a guy would have been asked the second question, not, 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 you know, maybe down the road or some other work life balance thing, maybe, maybe, maybe you know, but the second question out of the gate after, after how are you feeling about this? This has to be exciting was how did you balance your, your family life with your professional life? And, and I just found that to be interesting. And that was, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, Debbie, you said there was another question. 
There is. There is an education question, and our guest is, guest is asking, um, is it possible to be a career changer into engineering? Um, are there programs that make it possible to uh, start a second career and become an engineer, or do you really need to do it going from an undergrad or a grad degree into an engineering career? Well, I can just give an example. Uh, I know of some, I mean, we have women that work at UL come in in whatever facet and actually UL's tuition reimbursement program, they become engineers. Now, yes, they're in an engineering environment, but they could be doing anything within the company, whether it be in marketing and legal and the like. Um, it's perseverance, it's resilience, and it's a passion to learn. So I would answer certainly. Um, is it, is it, any easier? I think it all depends on your stage of life. Nothing stops you from doing it. And, and it's a little different depending on the field, because for those of us who need to have a professional engineer's license to perform our job, we basically need a bachelor's degree from an accredited school in engineering. So you can do that later in your career, but it's a whole lot of classwork. Um, well, and, and also, um, depending on what your experiences have been, um, I mean, to get your license, you, you don't actually have to have an engineering degree, depending on what you're interested in and what your background is. Um, if you have, a, I think it's 10 years of experience in, in something engineering related or construction related, something where you've been, you haven't been working as an engineer, but you've been surrounded by engineering and you've been exposed to it, then you can take the PE exam. And if you're able to pass, then you um, can go on and work as an engineer. Um, so it, it's, I think there, it's similar to some other industries out there where there is opportunity um, to engineering, but, and it doesn't have to be the traditional um, for your college route. Another thing that I've seen um, in the way that, uh, let's say, management consulting and business uh, works is often it can also be attracting engineers back from their undergraduate that have gone on to another field. So I know at my university, a lot of the engineers were in Michigan are taken by like the, the Baines and the McKinsey's. So another thing might be thinking about almost reshoring someone with a bachelor's degree that's a that's a woman that maybe didn't see a clear path or now has a lot of business experience they could easily like run they could run Jacobs they could run another company and so um, even Barb I'm thinking about UL like there's so many opportunities to have that hybrid and so it'd be nice to see a lot more of those business um, engineering backgrounds come kind of come back to the engineering companies. Well, I think that's all the time we had. Thank you for the wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed talking with each of you. Uh, and also thank you for kicking off National Engineers Week with us today. Um, thank you, Barbara Guthrie and Al Ramel. And thank you today's, to today's sponsors, UL, Weaver Consultants Group, Commissioner Mariana Spiropoulos of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, Salas O'Brien, and Mr. John Burcham. You are all welcome and encouraged to stay and mingle, but before I wrap up the official program for today, I'd like to mention some ways you can support Chicago Engineers Foundation in the next generation of engineers. First is to get involved. We always need people to virtually visit with students to get kids excited about STEM, share what we do in our careers and about scholarship opportunities. CEF needs mentors to help our college students with resumes and mock interviews and support our virtual career workshops. We also help our students find engineering internships and full-time positions and are grateful for any leads you can provide. If you would like to learn more, click the form link in the chat to be added to our contact list. Second, you can attend CEF events. In addition to today, please join us for All That Jazz on March 19th. That's our main fundraising event and it is virtual this year. In addition, we are hosting virtual engineering spotlight events throughout the year. And keep an eye on our website and social media platform, platforms for upcoming topics and dates. Finally, our incentive award celebration where we actually hand out the scholarship awards to our scholars is due on June 10th. 
It's a fantastic event with a great keynote speaker, but it's all about the students. If you're not yet hooked on this organization, you will be after that, and more details will be coming soon. Keep up with us at ChicagoEngineersFoundation.org or connect with us via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Thank you all very much for coming and have a great e-week in Chicago.